Uh, awesome. Okay. So, hey guys, I'm here with Terry Isles. Uh, Terry Isles has a PhD in psychology and he's best known as the stress doctor. Uh, what he does is he works with Inc. 500 CEOs, top level athletes, and helps them improve their performance under stress and under pressure. Uh, he's an accomplished author with several books. He provided emergency relief during 9-11, during the Haiti earthquakes and many other events. He's trained over 10,000 fighter pilots during his time in the army and regularly appears on CNN, Fox News and everything in between. Basically, when things go crazy, uh, people go to Terry to get their guidance and know, knowing, to know what to do and how to handle the situation. So that's why he's here. Uh, that's why I'm talking to him. And uh, I hopefully this is a very, it's gonna be a very productive discussion. So thanks for coming on the show, uh, Terry. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I look forward to the conversation. Beautiful. So uh, first thing I, I wanted to start with, uh, I guess it's, it's a very fitting thing, theme to get into the, into the call because a lot of the people watching are going to be CEOs and business owners uh, mm -hmm. is just uh, how stressful and how insane it is to be a CEO, uh, especially nowadays. And uh, w what happened to me right now is it's, it's a, it's a funny story. Like I, I, I was in between meetings, like most CEOs, like you run from thing mm -hmm. to thing, you're in a meeting and then you have to take care of an emergency and then there's a HR issue and things just go nuts all the time. And then I, I had the, the call coming up uh, while I was like stressed doing things, had to rush here, the mic didn't work, had to get that fixed. Then the, the, the two-year-old gave me a scratch on the face and I was like, oh crap, that's gonna, that's gonna show up. So just like handling pressure and-, and sure and uh, lots of uh, unknown variables all the time. Uh, my question to you is, is, with your experience working with Inc. 500 CEOs, and again, I'm, I'm nowhere near that, is it always like that? Uh, is it, is it uh, that uh, higher level CEOs, they just learn how to manage it better or do they create a, a, a style of business where that just doesn't happen as much? How do you usually see these things? Yeah, that's a great question because the anybody in the C-suite space, as we call it, CFO, CEO, you know, CIO, whatever your C is, um, you know, you're you're in charge of of people, which is leadership, and then things, which is management. So we lead people, we manage things. Mm -hmm. We don't manage people. You know, we manage things. We lead people. And I, I think when, when C-suite people get this kind of training, they realize if they've never had parts of it before, mm -hmm. that they love pressure. Mm -hmm. And if you don't love pressure, you're gonna exit pretty quickly. So the, the definition I give is, yeah, I train professional athletes in all kinds of sports. Uh, racing is my passion, but I train in all kinds of professional and amateur sport. Great athletes love their stress. I mean, they absolutely love it. They just don't use that word. Mm -hmm. They use another word. It's called competition. But competition and stress or pressure, whatever word you want to use, mm -hmm. is all the same thing. It is a potential gravitational pull trying to slow us down to getting to our goals and our dreams and our aspirations. So the great ones learn how to become more aerodynamic to get through that, around it, or over it, versus complain about it and slow down and try to stop or control it. Right. I've, I've noticed in, in my experience as a business owner that what happens is you deal with all this pressure and, and stress and, it, and it's, it's coming always from a different thing. The, the, the more your business grows from a different place. And um, what happens is you kind of learn how to handle that stress properly. You learn how to stay focused, how to get to your goal. And then suddenly it's like you level up you get to the next level and now your problems are a lot bigger. You have to deal with much more compli complex issues. And, right. uh, and, and it's like the stress doesn't necessarily get bigger. It's the complexity keeps going up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and I've noticed that there's also, the more your business grows, there's more of a delay between your actions and the, and the reactions and, and the results. Meaning when you are just starting a business, something happens, you simply react to it and solve it. And then the stress goes down. When you're a, a, a CEO of a company with 30 or 300 employees, something happens, you can't deal with it directly because it's probably a systematic problem that happens to, you know, across right. the board. So you have to talk to somebody who's in charge of that and he has to talk to other people. And so there's not that, uh, 
you, you never get that in instant relief that you would get as a starting business owner mm -hmm. where you can directly affect everything. You have to affect things tangentially. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess that's something I'm kind of learning how to navigate myself is, is how do you stay centered when everything has such a delayed effect, when there's a million things that you're not aware of, because again, once you're past a certain size, you can't see everything. You can't know everything. There's going to be things that you're missing. How do you handle that? And how do you kind of stay sane? Because again, mm -hmm. I'm asking at this level where I want to get to a level that's a thousand times bigger, where sure. I imagine the complexity is, is, is a million times bigger. Sure. Yeah. If I'm coaching with you right now and I'm not, we're just having a, a dialogue, but based upon the scenario you just presented to me, what I would suggest and challenge you with is trust is, is what has to be built. I, I love the word trust because the first three letters is true, T-R-U. And it means you have to be true to yourself and true to those people that you're interacting with. So that authenticity becomes your leadership model and your potential success or failure. So the more truth you can build in with people, that builds a trust, which is a bridge between you and them, that when something does go wrong, you can make one phone call, one email, one text and say, hey, I got you, you got me, tell me what just happened and let's get it corrected. So you're right, as you grow bigger, you can't touch everything, but you have to have that touch through the leaders that you have trained, that's why I do the training part, that they know that when they say something or do something, you've got their back, you see? Mm -hmm. So if that trust is broken, a lot like a relationship, a marriage, a business, whatever that is, and people start second guessing, that's when things can get catastrophic pretty quickly. Because if there's a breakdown between, as I call communications, the engine oil in your engine of your car, if you take that oil out, you got about you know 90 seconds to two, two and a half minutes maybe, and your engine's gonna seize up because of heat. So communication keeps things from heating and expanding and it blowing up. It keeps it lubricated so you can continue to have dialogue to make things work. So trust at first level is really big. I love the, the example of race car driving. I mean, I've dealt with 25, I think now at this point, race car drivers in Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, sports car. I love cars. I grew up in Indianapolis by the racetrack. I grew up loving cars. But I liken this to the driver in the car driving 230 miles an hour in Indianapolis, as an example. He has an earpiece in both ears that he's listening to his crew chief, who's telling him what's happening with the car, with the strategy of the pit stop. He's listening to one other person who's the spotter up in the stands, high in the war, that can see everything. Mm -hmm. Because all he or she can see is about this. That's all you can see. Your mm -hmm. head does not turn this way because you're locked in so you don't break your neck. So you literally have almost no vision. You have to trust your crew chief's information. You have to trust the eyes and the voice of your spotter to tell you when you're clearing someone at 230 miles an hour so you don't clip them and hit the wall. That mm -hmm. level of trust is my definition of leadership. If you're the CEO, you're the driver, but you have to trust the people that are calling other shots around you in other departments, and you have to trust the spotter who's your visionary person who's helping you see what you don't see. That combination becomes a winning formula if you have the right people in places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, that, that, was, that was definitely a, a huge problem we've had at the beginning where we would keep statistics uh, very intuitively, you could say, like we had some basic weekly breakdowns of what was happening. And then as the company grew, uh, we realized there's, you have to start tracking and measuring things because if you don't, uh, things get out of hand very quickly and you have to run by, by word of mouth. So how do you, how do you, um, how do you put these two pieces back in, in place where on one hand you want to trust people, but on the other hand, you need to see, you know, that, that Russian thing of, of trust, but verify, like, how do you, how do you mm. reconcile these two? Well, you know, th that's a great question because the system has to be, you know, communication, which is the top level. You have to start with communication. If, you're, if you don't have a clear message and you're not presenting it on a regular basis, people are confused. So vision has right. to be cast on a regular basis, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. You have to continue to create and talk about the vision of the organization, uh, the, the platitudes of what's going to happen. So communication is the first one. The second one is you need something very important that you just mentioned, which is systems. 
you need to have systems that can help systematize things that are going on that we can miss as human beings because there's just so many moving balls and spinning plates around us. Mm -hmm. So we need communication, we need systems. The third thing is you need accountability. And so if I put that in military terms, that's planning a mission, briefing the mission, executing, and then debriefing it. So you have to have a system in place because you're right, things can get out of control very quickly. So it's like accounting, you know, it's checks and balances. You can just keep writing checks and writing checks. Now we don't even do that. You just swipe your card, swipe your card, swipe your card. And all of a sudden you get a notice that says you just bounced your account, mm -hmm. you know? And then you either have to deposit more money or transfer more money. A lot of us seem to function in that kind of haywire, let's just keep, you know, writing checks and swiping our card until it dings us and then we correct it. The best way to go about it is to have a check and a balance that you know what's in there before you do it, at least with some understanding, and then you do it accordingly. So that's the system side. So if you don't have communication, systems, and accountability, you're going to have problems. Right. And how would you recommend to a business owner who's in a position where, uh, let's say his business grew above a certain size and, and things are hectic, how would you recommend to approach getting things organized? Meaning, what would you, what would you start with? How, what would be the, the plan? Well, I think, first of all, you start with, you know, the people. You, you, you have to have the right people in place. I, I, you know, it's been commonly said that, you know, there's only so many seats on a bus, but I, don't, I just don't want a bunch of people in the bus if they're working with me and around me. I need the right people in the right seats. I don't want the blind person driving the bus. The blind person can do a lot of other things, you know, but I don't want them driving the bus for a lot of obvious reasons because they can't see what they're doing, okay? Yeah. So that's your visionary. So you got to have your visionary kind of driving your bus. And that should be the CEO and the president, and they can vacillate between it back and forth. So you have to have people in the right seats on your bus to make sure that you have continuity. So the first thing is find and hire the right people. Because if you don't, you're going to end up in the pits a lot you know, because things are going to keep breaking down. So I tell this to companies all the time, look, you have to identify and hire the right people. If you have the wrong people, you either have to realign them or you've got to remove them because you'll keep creating the same thing over and over again, still expecting a, a different result, which is the definition of insanity. You have to get the right people in the right positions and then you support them. So if you, if you have people that are not doing what they're doing, they A, need training slash coaching, which is part of what I do to get them there. And then if they can't get there, you have to realign them or you have to jettison them because the business is an organization. It's more important than one or two people. It's the overall lifeblood of that operational business that earns money for everyone who works for that organization. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And what would you say are the differences between, uh, a business that's, uh, let's say, 300 employees versus one that's 30,000 in your experience? You know, it, it's, it's very similar. Uh, you just have to have the right breakpoints of who's in charge of this layer. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have executive management, then you have management, then you can have co-executive management, and then you have departments and silos and verticals and all these things. So it becomes tentacles all mm -hmm. throughout the organization, which is fine, but you have to have the right leaders at the head of each of those levels and organizations. So typically what I do coaching on is not so much the silo issue of training and coaching, which is, you know, we're, we're this way, like, you know, vertically set up, but it's more of we're, we're a circle and all of us are around the circle and we feed to the middle. And the middle is this, this centrifugal force, which is the lifeblood of that business. Mm. So if I need access, let's say I'm two or three levels around, but I need access to you as the, as the owner of the company. Mm -hmm. I may not be able to get directly to you, but mm -hmm. I need to know if something goes on, I can get to you by making a phone call or an email to the person that I report to. Mm -hmm. So I need the access to get to you because if you're at the centrifugal force and I can't get to you at some point, things could go wrong that you can't correct for the next six or eight months. So if you've got 30 people or 30,000 people, there has to be those break points where the communication, again, is open, the systems are clear, 
and the accountability is relevant that we can know that I got your back, you got my back. And that's where we started this conversation is you have to have trust in yourself and your people and stay true north to your business focus to be profitable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's been um, like a wacky journey because my, my business essentially had uh, two employees when it started uh, 10 months ago. Mm -hmm. And now it has uh, about 30 and sure. that, that quick jump, uh, really forced me and my partner to, to understand how to communicate properly and how to structure the business. And, mm -hmm. and at the beginning we thought, uh, you know, let's just hire people to like assistance to get things done. And we realized like fastest on the point, you have to get high quality people. You have to get brains that that uh can take charge of things and we, we really found that out when we hired one specific employee and she was so amazing that she ended up taking over about half of the business in terms of <laughs> management like suddenly right. things just happened automatically it almost sure. felt like you know when you're a kid and your mom kind of does the the laundry for you or makes right. dinner for you and you're like it just magically appears uh, yeah so that's uh that's how it felt um but still there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, what I consider like good stress and and bad stress. So, yeah. so you said earlier that people who are high performance performers they love the the stress. Uh, yes. But but I would actually challenge you: do, do they love all kinds of stress, or do do they love specific kinds of stress? Meaning that high performer, let's say um, they, they they have a game they need to practice for tomorrow, and then right. And then they get a, uh, a letter coming in saying, you know, your mom, your mother is sick or, or, right. you know, there's a, a huge lawsuit just came in. Uh, yeah. That's a different kind of stress than, Absolutely. oh my God, I'm going to show up in front of 80,000 people and I have, I have to perform well. That's correct. Um, how do you, yeah. how do you there's deal with the two kinds of stresses? Yeah, there's different levels of stress. You know, there's acute stress, which is something like you just mentioned. Someone just got a phone call and something catastrophic happened in their family. That's acute stress. That situational, it's explosive, and, and you have to put a tourniquet on it. You know, you can't just keep walking around while you're bleeding out emotionally. Mm -hmm. Those are emergency situations you put a tourniquet on. But performance stress is different because you, you know you have – an opportunity to perform and you prepare and train accordingly to perform yeah. when it's time to do that. But acute yeah. stress is always around us. I could be driving where I want to go and somebody cuts me off in traffic and you know, it makes me crazy. And then all of a sudden my emotions get hijacked and I'm, you know, whatever I could get into an accident. I'm following people yeah. to wherever they're going and I'm going the wrong way because I've been hijacked emotionally, as I say. So that acute stress is always there. It's not that you love the acute stress, it's that you love that you know that you can navigate if you use the same principles mm -hmm. that you do on your performance stress. I actually have a coin that I use with uh, all my people. You said I challenge you. You just asked me that I challenge you. So it's actually called a challenge coin. So there it is. <laughs> it's a picture of a guy hanging off a cliff, but he's not freaking out because he's climbing the cliff. He prepared. Okay, so it says good stress and then challenge. But when you flip the coin over, it's now a threat and there's a storm, so that's bad stress. So mm. here's the difference. I give this to performers I work with, and it's a reminder to them, whether it's on their <laughs> desk like mine, I have coins around mine for military service. That, that coin is a reminder to me that I am a flip of a coin of a way from a bad day and a good day, from a bad meeting and a good meeting, from a, from a bad scenario of acute something to something I, that I, I'm taking care of. Mm -hmm. It is really that simple if you know how to flip the coin. In other words, you cannot fight cortisol in our bodies. You know, that's a stress hormone. It's a cataclysmic event. It takes about 20 to 30 seconds. Your heart rate changes, your blood flow changes, your thoughts, everything becomes linear and shortened. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, beliefs, emotions, physical acuity, muscles, tendons, oxygenation, everything shortens. So when everything gets short, under that's bad stress because we need to be linear in that point of performance and elongated. We need long, loose muscles, long, loose thoughts, long, loose emotional uh, acuity. So cortisol is a stress hormone when it's hijacked inside of us, everything shortens because it's fight flight. Mm -hmm. 
So I either run away from it because I'm in danger, and it, but if I have training, like fire rescue operatives, FBI, you know, military personnel, they run into harm's way because they've been trained to know that if they can take care of it quicker, it makes everything better. That's why training is so important for all of us in life, in business, in marriage, in child rearing. It's all the same. Training is the differentiator between success longed for and success procured. Okay, good, good. And and let's say as an entrepreneur, and and I, I bet most of the people listening to this kind of relate to what I'm going to say now. You're you you're a high achiever. You're a person who wants to do something big. <clears throat> That means you handle problems on a day-to-day -day level, like lots of stuff coming at you. Obviously, the better, the more successful you are, the more things will come at you. Mm -hmm. um, so throughout the day, you navigate through different kinds of stress, uh, the good yep. stress and the bad stress. Um, right. how, how do you actually navigate uh, successfully through those in, in the sense that how do you like as an as an entre as an entrepreneur again because that that is where the confusion is you're a salesperson you need to sell marketing person you need to market hr you need to do hiring like there's very much specificity when you're an entrepreneur you're a bit of everything so it's you never know exactly where your place is uh which mm -hmm. means you combine uh doing just the regular day-to-day -day stuff the habits the com complicated things the things that require a lot of brain power you have to combine all of them and throughout that through that chaos you have to somehow navigate from let's say a stress inducing situation mm -hmm. because something happened and you need to deal with it immediately like for example okay. i i just got a call from an employee and i said okay i'm i'm not going to pick it up to be on the to stay focused but then in, in the back of my mind i'm like oh did something happen is something wrong and and i know i've got other people that can take care of it but but at the same time, it's still there. I want to know what it is. Uh, so that's a very good example. You know, you want to, I want to be here and, and do this, but then this comes up. So how do you, how do you nav navigate through that storm where things are calm and you're focused and then suddenly something comes up and now your cortisol went up and now you have to go back to focusing on something that requires brain power. But then there's something you need to take care of that's important for next week. But then as an entrepreneur, you also want to look at next year and the right. big vision. So how do you, how do you balance all of these mm. forces that are always wanting your attention and, uh, and, and kind of pushing you in all sorts of directions? Yeah, it's a great question because we are pulled in so many directions now, especially because of technology. I mean, I write about this in my last book I was writing about, you know, techno stress, and how that we've entered another age over the past decade that none of us have really gone through and we're, we're figuring it out as we go. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned you have a two-year-old. You hand a computer or a phone to your two-year-old, I mean, he or she'll figure it out, hack it, and give it back to you. Um, it's almost like they're, they're born with a chip because they grew up playing with it where many of us grew up kind of understanding parts of it, but not the way they do with this generation that's just now coming on. So techno stress, has been around for 30 years actually. And we've studied it from machine learning to machine activation to how does that impact us, whether it's light sensitivity on our bodies, whether it's a molecular things that's going on in our environment. There's a lot of techno stress that's out there. But with technology that we know, i.e. pads, phones, computers, emails, texts, phone calls, like you just said, you're doing a podcast with me, you get a, a text or an email and you're like, okay, somebody will handle that. But in the back of your head, you're thinking, but what if they need me? So here's the key. Look, we can all be down in that level that we think we have to take care of everything. But listen, being in the now, staying in the now, which is one of the most profound things that great performers do. They know how to stay in the now. They see things around there in their peripheral vision. They know there's things going on behind the stage and the scene. And, but they got to stay in the now because this is what we're doing at this moment. But the best way to do that throughout the day, which was your challenge to me, which is how do you go from planning for five years to taking care of something right now in HR to, you know, going back to being creative, it's recovery. We need oscillatory recovery all day. Our body and our minds 
are functioning like our heart and our brain. Our EKG and EEG looks like this all day, hopefully. It's bam, uh, up, down, stress recovery, stress recovery. That's what it looks like. A, a, a screen like this on an EKG or an EEG is a really bad day, okay? You're flatlined, okay? That means there's no oscillation or there's no movement. Here's what we do in corporate America in most cases. We tend to work like this. We don't take breaks. We don't take correct breaks and we don't- So uh, when you go like this, you mean at the, at the peak? Flat line. Mean, uh... Flat line. Oh, like okay. you, move. you stay in your chair too long. Hmm. You go without eating too long. Uh, you, you don't know how to break focus to recharge your batteries because focus needs to be broken and we know it's about 90 to 120 minutes. So just let's just say it's about two hours, two and a half hours. We need to oscillate because that's the way we're wired. Mm -hmm. We're wired for success, programmed for failure, okay? So we just do what everybody else does and thinks that'll work. It's not the way it works. Our wiring and our DNA is recovery. You have a two-year-old. You remember it's only been two years. I've got grown kids. So two-year-old, you know that when they're infants, they basically only do three things. They eat, they sleep, and they export diapers. That's it. That's their whole life, you know? And it's done about every two, three hours. They're constantly eating. And if they're not eating, they're sleeping. And if they're not eating or sleeping, they're changing their diaper because it woke them up, okay? Th because they're eating so often and sleeping so often, that is our DNA. We're meant to recover on a regular basis. Every 90 to 120 minutes, we need a quick recovery break, two to five minutes. That's it, two to five. 90 minutes on, two to five minutes off. It could be as simple as getting up from my chair after this uh, podcast, go to the restroom, go get a glass of water, take a few minutes, think about, okay, what's my next thing next mm -hmm. hour, come back, sit down. It recharges my batteries. You can only be as good as your recovery. And I commonly say to people, I'm the copy of my book, the cover is performance under pressure. The only way you can elite perform mm -hmm. is this. You will never out train your training. In other words, you've got to do it better than you plan to do it and you do it on a regular basis. So you'll never outperform your training, number one. Number two, performance, real performance, human performance, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical performance is measured in the speed of recovery. How quickly can you get pulled off focus and get back? That's mental recovery. Mm. How quickly can you be emotionally hijacked and get back to normal? That's emotional recovery. How quickly can you get pulled off? I don't know if I believe in this anymore for the system, the, our economy, the business. That's spiritual recovery. Physical recovery is your energy levels. How quickly can you lose energy by being stagnant and get your energy back that you can perform? That is physical recovery. And we know that by doing EKGs and EEGs on people in, in medical facilities. So the key is oscillation. The power of the pit stop in racing is to refuel, retire, go back out, mock two with your hair on fire. Don't slow down. Go drive the wheels off of it, but you got to come in and change the tires and you need to be refueled about every 90 to 120 minutes because if you don't pit stop, you can't finish the race. Beautiful, beautiful. So so that, that's, a, that's a huge paradigm shift because yes, uh, is. what you're saying is you're not going to be as good as you perform. You're going to be as good as you rest between that's correct. Performances. And um, you mentioned a bunch of types of uh, recoveries, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, but before that, I wanted to ask the obvious question. So when you recover, uh, you mean without your phone, right? Well, yeah. I mean, you could I mean, if use you, your If you go to recovery and then you open your phone and then things come up, you know, oh, there's a message and somebody needs me to... Yeah, that's not recovery. That's not that, recovery. You, you, just, you just transition one stress to another. But you could use your phone to recover. You could use your phone and call home and talk to your wife or your daughter or your son or, you know. Oh, you, yeah, I, I meant in the consumption sense, not in the. Yeah. Well, well, you have to, you know what, this is the beauty of having power over our own capacities from our mind body. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to just zoom it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, It's like our mind is constantly doing this. You got to zoom it down, zoom it down, zoom it down. So I use my phone as task. You know, I can call someone, I can text, I can email, I can do all those things. But if I'm constantly checking my phone in my recovery, going to the bathroom, <laughs> going to get water, that's not recovery. I just oscillated one stress for the other. 
you literally now if you can play a game on your phone or if you listen to some comedy that makes you laugh or okay that's recovery so technology is not the enemy yeah the information I, overload that is the negative part of that stress becomes the enemy and that's what flatlines us and that's why we die on the vine in performance that's why yeah. a lot of performers will go only so far and they they hit a ceiling yeah and they're like i can't go faster i don't know how to do more with less i don't and that's where i normally come in and go look you have to have a paradigm shift as you just said it's not about pushing harder it's about chilling through the day in small morsels picking up energy and vitality and creativity all day that at the end of your day not only did you rock it you've got energy and and motivation to go home to do it with the people you love the most your family beautiful um what about guilt what so i i for example um i i i i used to be a huge video gamer uh okay. played video games every day for like eight hours a day till age 16. Right. Um, I stopped com cold, like just completely doing that sure. as, as I was pursuing my success. Mm -hmm. And only recently in the past few months, I kind of got back to it a bit. And uh, I, I use it occasionally as a recovery tool, uh, sure. meaning I, I have a, a call that I don't need to be fully focused in. I'll, I'll just pop up a video game while I'm on the call and sure. helps me kind of chill out or, yep. but, but, if I'm not on a call doing that one hour of playing a video game, for example, or if I'm not doing something productive immediately, and you probably know that very well, because you coach so many people, what comes up is guilt comes in, right? I have so much things to get done. I need to get to this. Why are you not focused on this? And, and as a matter of fact, like even my wife might like come in and let's say I would sneak that, uh, right that not even an hour, like 20 minutes of just opening a, a video game. Sure. I would feel guilty. Like I'm not doing, I'm doing something wrong. I should not be doing this. I should right. be working. Right. And my, my wife might come like walk through the door and she see me That's and she'd true. be like, Oh, you're not working. You're, you're doing this instead of, instead right. of, uh, helping with the baby or instead of, uh, right. you know, finishing the day earlier because you worked harder. So, so well, then I don't even rest because it's like the, the, the no, guilt kind of hurts the rest all the time. Here's here, what you said is so powerful because this is what I do in corporate America. You know, I mean, I, I tell them you have to change your conversation at first. And we just had this conversation, you and I together early. It takes conversations, systems and accountability. Right. So you have to change the conversation first off the one between your own ears. That recovery is healing. All right. It's like sleeping. It's like eating. It's like going to the bathroom. It's like hydrating. It's like breathing clean air. It's like sunshine, you know, to, for vitamin D, melatonin reuptake inhibitors, which is natural Prozac. You know, you, you have to change the mindset that my recovery, whether it's a video game, whether it's looking out the window, whether it's closing my eyes as, as if I'm going to take a short nap just to not think about anything. You have to let yourself off the hook. And you mentioned another interesting word, guilt. What you're describing is not guilt. What you're describing is shame. Shame is when you've done nothing wrong and you feel guilty. Guilt is when you feel guilty because you've done something wrong. Mm. Okay. So you've got to flip that coin that it's not about guilt. It's shame. I'm putting that pressure on myself. And now I've created my recovery and now I've turned it into bad stress for me. That, you might as well just go back to doing what you're doing. Exactly. But you can let yourself off the hook to learn how to recover and know that recovery is the it, performance is measured in that speed of recovery. You're only as good as your pit stop. So when you can, A, do that yourself and then communicate that in your example with your wife, your child, your coworkers, that when you catch them in recovery, understand they're in recovery. That's cool because I'm going to get more out of you in the next 90 minutes because you're going to come up with the next idea. You're going to push the envelope. We're going to become more profitable. I'm going to let you have your recovery because right. that is the key to performance success. So you have to start the conversation, number one, with ourselves, mm -hmm. and then you have to communicate with others in your environment so they all know that if I catch you in recovery, that means the next great thing is ready to happen. So, so this, this is actually leading, I think this is beautiful. I I'm sharing here more than I thought I would. <laughs> so, That's okay, man. It's um, so, so, 
for example, where this comes, comes back negatively for me is I would then see my wife on, on her phone resting because she's also a, a hard sure. worker yeah. or my partner would, would send me a picture of him in the hot tub because he lives in a, in a right. beautiful mansion in Colombia. And I would almost feel mad when yeah, I see sure. it. Like, it's like, it's this, it's basically the, the flip side of shame only yeah. externalized. Like if I'm not supposed to Dang. be resting, how, how are you resting? And, and it's almost like, um, it's just people, two people like reinforcing, like I'm imagining in my head, like two people that really need sleep. And when, when one of them finally falls asleep, the other one like bumps them in the head. Right. Like, wake wake up. up. <laughs> Well, and that's the, that's the paradigm shift. When you understand that, mm -hmm. look, I can recover from other people's recovery if I allow myself to. Okay, somebody else could be having a great time. I'm, I'm working hard to, at this moment. I'm doing what I do, but I know that somebody else is – I could look out my window here and see that someone's lying out there just chilling, but I'm in here talking with you and staying focused and doing what I do. It's not my job to hate on that person. I look at that and go – I'm glad I live in a place where you can do that, where it doesn't snow. You know, I live in, yeah. I live in South Florida, you know, there's a blizzard up North. If you haven't heard, you know, and I live here and it's like palm trees blowing in the window. You see, it's all about how do you wrap that perception, that challenge threat response, which is what I call that. How do you take that threat of your business partner in a hot tub and make that your challenge, which is thank God I've got a business partner that can do that. But when you're not busy, send me some more capital. You know what I'm saying? And you turn it into humor. You turn it into something that works for the both of you. Because when you're in stress, I could be in recovery. When I'm in stress, you could be in recovery. Mm -hmm. and it, it even gets more dynamic. I mean, I write about this in the book. Your stress could be my recovery, believe it or not. And my recovery could be your stress. I've got a, I got a neighbor that lives next door to me, okay? Mm -hmm. He loves his lawn. I mean, he is in love with his lawn. I mean, he manicures, he mows, and he's out there tweaking. And, and I watch him, and it's like, that's cool. Not my thing. I, I hire people to come do my lawn because that's stress to me. I don't want to go out there when it's 80 degrees and do my lawn. That's stress. To him, it's recovery, okay? But then he'll see me go running in the morning in 90-degree temperature. You, could, you, he, you couldn't chase him with a gun. He wouldn't, he wouldn't run. So my, my recovery is his stress. Yeah. So here's the cool part, Robbie. This is really, this is a very powerful thing to understand. Everything is stress. It's gravity. Where can you go on this planet where there's not gravity? Yeah. You have to leave our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So stress is gravity. There's good gravity, bad gravity. No, you either cooperate with it or it deals with you. So you teach your two-year-old, if you're going to jump off that table, you better prepare for landing. So I teach people how to land, okay? So you can enjoy the excitement of jumping. It only lasts for a moment, but then you're gonna hit, okay? So we have to prepare for our landing, which is recovery. How am I gonna recover after I jump off this building? Do I jump in water? Did I use a bungee cord? So it's all about recovery. It's all about our landing and knowing what the end result's gonna be. So it's very powerful to know that I can control that between the space in my head, which is in the mental section of the book. Mm -hmm. How do I mentally control my thoughts, my focus, my aptitude of creativity? Mm -hmm. All that is fed through recovery because that's where we get our energy from. Nice, so, so yeah, you, you literally just flipped the, the paradigm completely. Flip the coin, baby. It's that simple. <laughs> That's why I use it. And people, when they get that, they'll call me back or they'll text me and go, you know what, that coin, I thought it was kind of weird. And, you know, but he, they go, and I have them do exercises when I do training like this. I do Zoominars and I do training with companies, mm -hmm. mainly executive management groups. Mm -hmm. Like we'll have 15 or 20 people, like you're talking about the executive team of a company. And I'll have them do exercise. And I'll say, mark down three things that are driving you nuts right now at work that are huge threats. It could be COVID, the economy, the uncertainty of the election. It could be what is 22 going to be. I don't care. Whatever. Write down three things. And they write them down. I say, okay, that's your threat, right? Yep. That's my threat. It's driving me crazy. I want you to draw a line in your head or on your paper or on your computer. And I want you to solve that. I want you to do the diabolical opposite of that. I want you to create a solution for that threat. 
And then they go and they think and they think and they put a solution. And I go, all you have to do is it's A or it's B and then just flip the coin. It is really that simple. We make it complicated because we think it's more complicated than it is. Because we get folk, we love negativity. It's just how we're wired. Mm-hmm. We, we love gossip. We love negativity. That's why the housewives of Mars, all these cities and states that have housewife shows, you know, all this reality TV is normally like a negative base. There are some that's positive, but people love negativity because it makes them feel better about their inadequacies. And that's the psychological piece. But when you can realize that it's not the negativity, we transition negative to positive. There's no bad emotion, as an example. That's in the emotional section of the book. There's Mm -hmm. no bad emotion. There's positive emotions. There's negative emotion. Mm -hmm. They're either high or low, positive or negative. It's like a battery. You have a positive post and you have a negative post. Your battery won't work if you eliminate either one of them. It's called polarity. You need both to work together. But if you touch them together, it arcs. Mm. It becomes bad, (laughs) okay? So they have to be uh, anchored on the negativity side, which gives it a ground, and then they need a positive flow of energy to put the energy into that battery or into that business or whatever that is. So your business has positive aspects, it has negative. The negative is the grounding. You can't get away from it, keep it isolated in its own place. Insulate it and then isolate it to where it needs to be, but then the positive side is go out and do, 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 do. If it starts arcing, that means that there's been some rubbing again and your, and your cables and your, 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 you've lost connection and it's arcing. So now instead of it flowing down to the ground for negativity and a cross flow for positivity, they're arcing. So now my signal's crossing. That's called bad communication, bad systems, no accountability. So you got to go back and reconnect, man. You got to keep the negative over here, positive over here, utilize the positive, keep the negative grounded because you can't work with one or the other. You need both. You just have to contain them. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Terry. That's You're welcome. Not, really good. Uh, where yeah. can people find that coin? Uh, it's on my website, actually. Uh, Terry Lyles, T E R R Y L Y L E S dot com. And uh, my book is there, Performance Under Pressure. Um, you know, I, I, this is my fourth book. Uh, it's the best work I've done. I, I'm so proud of it because it took me almost two years to do it because of a lot of issues. Mm-hmm. You know, just trying to get it done and find time like you're talking about. How do you find time to sit out and write when I'm traveling and chasing all these other things? So I would write on planes and I would write in the middle of the night. I, I said it was like birthing an elephant. It takes 24 months for an elephant to birth. <laughs> so this is my elephant. Um, yeah. But I got it done. But performance under pressure, you know, one of the the guy that wrote the forward for me, he's a retired two-star general from the Air Force, uh, Robert Worley. Uh, I, I've got some great quotes great uh, people in there that have shared their stories about what they've done in stress and how they've survived it. So yeah, everything at terrylyles.com and uh, look forward to reconnecting and helping in any way that I possibly can for you as well. But the coin for sure is, it's a very powerful thing. So even if you just put an email through and say, hey, send me a coin, you know, I'll send it to you and we'll figure it out. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Do you have an audiobook version of uh, Performance Under Pressure? I do not as a reading audio, but I I produced a video synopsis of every chapter. There's 12 chapters. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's available as well. So that's that's a downloadable piece that you can just download and listen to a synopsis of each chapter. And Mm -hmm. it's really more like the author's version, which says, here's what inspired that chapter. Here's what I was thinking about. Here was my mindset. Here was my potential resolution, you know, to that chapter. And it was really fun to do. And it's a video. So it, and it's video clips that are short. You can send them out to friends and go, look, you're stressing me out, man. You need recovery. Watch this, <laughs> you know? And, and, and remember, you got to keep all this fun. That's the exciting part. You know, life is about keeping things simple. Mm-hmm. I, have a, I have a grown, I'll end with this with you. I, I have a grown special needs son who is in a wheelchair. He's never spoken. He's never walked. Um, he's about 65 pounds. And like I said, he's, he's wheelchair bound. He's still diaper and fed as an infant. And he has been the motivational challenge in my life because that could have been the most threatening thing that ever happened to me. And it took me three years to figure out how to flip that coin. And after I'd learned to flip that coin, it became the driving force of my life to do everything I do. It drove, drove me to finish school with a PhD. It drives me in corporate America. It drives me with professional athletes. 
he has opened more doors for him. He had never spoken a word and none, never done anything on his own because his life is so big inside of me. And that's the inspirational section of the book. What inspires you is what propels you to be who you are. So what, regardless of what you have in your life, don't run from it. Stop, identify, evaluate, embrace it, work on it, and just move to the future, man, and make that a part of your success. So I never want to stop until I say a shout out to my son, Brandon, who literally has given me the understanding of a life that I have. And it's, it's a very powerful thing in my world because we all have junk in our life. Most of us try to hide it, put it away, not deal with it. You can't live life like that. You got to go in, open those dark doors, go in, unpack it, try to figure it out and live with it. Flip the coin. Flip the coin, man. Over and, and sometimes I got to do it over and over and over on the same thing every day. We put him in a, a, a home facility here in South Florida during COVID, at the beginning of COVID. And we haven't seen him since because we can't get in. You know, so we did what was best for him, but it's become a threat to, to us because we can't even get back in and see him. And, but it was best for him. So I had to make that my challenge versus my threat because it's his best challenge. So it, there's a constant protocol that we all have to follow and it's sanity. And we create that sanity by our belief systems and understanding of how do we make the world a better place, regardless of how it works for me. I want to make sure it works for everybody and that I can benefit from as well. That is a bonus. Beautiful. Beautiful. I think, I think it's time for you to reach uh, mass audiences, Terry. I think the message is uh, definitely helpful for top performers, but I think the, the rest of the world just needs to hear that. So I'll, I'll do my Thank best you. to help you push that message out to. Thank you. And I'll, I'll well. push this link out as well. And, um, I have a seminar that's coming up to the general population. Actually, I've only, I don't do many of these, but I'm doing one in January, January 9th. It's on the website. Uh, my wife is a nutritional physiologist. She's, she was on Broadway. She's a performer, a dancer, a singer. She's going to take the body side of, of the, of the challenge that day. And I'm going to do the mindset and mm -hmm. we're going to parlay it together. So it's January 9th. It'll be a really fun couple, three hours. We have a cocktail party at the end, all virtual, obviously. The Zoominar. Um, Zoominar, yeah, baby. It's a fun time. People get to network and hang out and party a little bit and learn some cool things. So January 9th, it's on the website as well. So if people go there, sign up. Beautiful. Get Give me, send me the link. I'll put it at the bottom of the video. De definitely will. Amazing. Terry, thank you so much. Thank you, Robbie. Appreciate it. Me too.